All right. So, Steph, I'll let okay. you start. Great. Introductions. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Steph. I am a postdoc here at Harvard Medical School, and we're really excited today to share with you this event this afternoon where we'll be discussing issues surrounding research reproducibility with a special focus on proposing solutions to this issue. Um, we'd also like to say welcome and hello to everyone joining us over the live stream as well. Um, first, we're going to start with a series of short talks discussing research reproducibility within the scientific community and how scientists themselves can help to address this issue. And then we'll have a great panel with a number of people from different areas outside of academia. And we'll talk about how these areas, such as journals and industry, interact with uh, the academic community. And we'd like to say thank you, especially to Adgene and the Harvard Science Policy Group for organizing and supporting this event. And also thank you to all of our sponsors, um, many of whom are organizations and companies with reproducibility driven missions. And that's really important to us um, for this particular event. And you can learn more about them in the pamphlets there. And it's also posted onto the event page as well. And we'll hope um, that you all continue the discussion with us after the um, event, and we'll have a little bit of food and drink in the back of the room afterwards um, to continue the discussions. So with that, I would like to hand it off to um, Jeffrey Flyer, who's our first speaker. Um, Jeffrey served as the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Harvard University from 2007 to 2016. He is a Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor and George Higginson Professor of Physiology and Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, he's authored more than 200 scholarly papers and reviews and is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And we're really excited for him to introduce this topic to us. Thank you, Jeffrey. There we go. And just move with this, right? Uh, just give it a quick look at this. Oh, just Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Now we go back. All right. Well, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here to uh, give you some high level thoughts about research reproducibility or irreproducibility, depending on which side of the coin you want to uh, examine. Uh, and I'm doing this from the perspective of 35 plus years as a research scientist and a number of years, uh, as stated, uh, running a large organization where a great deal of research takes place. And I've learned a lot along the way, and I've taken an interest in this subject in the last uh, couple of years. So the outline of the talk uh, is just uh, before you here, a little bit on the context of the issue, what is research reproducibility? What can we say about its prevalence? Uh, thinking like a physician scientist, what's the pathogenesis? Why does this issue come about? And then a few thoughts about potential therapies. So the big picture is starting off with the positives, okay? There's been a tremendous amount of uh, progress in biomedical science. It's truly remarkable. Uh, and that has led to an enhanced understanding and treatment of human disease. And from the time that I entered biomedical research in the mid 70s to today, it's just stunning what we know now that we didn't know then, both in my own area of interest, metabolic disease, and, and much more broadly. That has taken place uh, as we've had tremendous growth in the magnitude, the scope, the professionalization of bioscience. It's really rather stunning. Uh, there's an enormous growth of scientific faculties. The Harvard Medical School faculty has gone up fourfold in that period. Uh, there's more than a million publications per year in the biological, biomedical sciences. That's unimaginable, but it's true. Uh, thousands of journals, many new ones coming on board. Uh, and uh, perhaps $100 billion is spent here uh, on research, uh, plus or minus a few billion. The ecosystem in which this takes place is itself extremely uh, complex. Uh, it's many universities, academic health centers, biopharmaceutical companies. There's no one who directs all of this. There's no single organization that says how it should be done. There's a lot of autonomy. So uh, hence the, the complications of trying to figure out what's going on and what to do about it. Uh, 
Then the other thing to point out is uh, in research, there will always be errors. There will be dead ends. There will be claims that are made in good faith that turn out to be mistaken. Many other problems. And these are part of the scientific enterprise. And the idea, the whole theme of how science is supposed to work and does work most often is that it's self-correcting. So when someone makes a claim, puts it in the literature, other scientists look at it, think, do they want to do something related to that? Uh, and they will, uh, over time, correct errors that are made. And that's the way it has to be, because there is no other way. Uh, and these errors are maybe especially uh, um, uh, expected in exploratory research. And perfect reproducibility is obviously impossible and undesirable. You wouldn't want to create a system where uh, everything that's published has already been checked 17 different times by five different groups independently so that it'll all be correct. Uh, that's not the goal. That would be a huge waste of resources. However, uh, there is increasing evidence that irreproducibility of published bioscience today is at a level that is excessive, and some would say it's alarmingly high. And I'm getting close to pressing the alarm button. Uh, and why do we care about this? Well, if it's true, to the extent that it's true, uh, it obviously diminishes the progress that is the reason why we go into research is to make progress, to learn more and have impact. But also it threatens the confidence in research by funders and the public, which means it may end the enterprise or cause it to be shrunk. There are people saying, oh, if we waste uh, half of our research money, let's cut it back by half. And you know, we may be faced by that one of these days. So now let me just say a few words, and of course each one of these points could be a whole uh, you know, separate lecture, but uh, uh, what does reproducibility of research mean? It's not a simple issue, and it's an ambiguous definition. Most papers are never reproduced and likely they shouldn't be. Precise replication is the kind of most stringent uh, test, and that is take the exact same experiment as best you can, similar reagents, and see if you can get exactly what the first authors uh, produced. This is rarely done. Uh, and it, when is it done? It typically is done when there's a very high profile claim that's published in a high profile journal that affects many scientific efforts. And uh, people start looking at it and they say, wait, I don't, that doesn't look right to me. And therefore they may decide to put their effort into simply saying if they could reproduce it or not. And they even go to the extent of publishing their failure to reproduce it because the world is interested. Two examples taken from the Harvard system, unfortunately, are the, the beta trophin molecule claimed to be stimulating beta cell repl replication out of the stem cell department and STAP cells claiming that you could make a fibroblast into a stem cell. And both of these have been thoroughly debunked and they've both been uh, withdrawn. Uh, and other negative implications took place related to at least one of those. Uh, now, since that's not done for most papers that you will ever publish, uh, 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 the other thing that happens is if a finding is seen to be robust, that is, it may be seen to be true without anyone having actually tried to replicate it, that means that you can build on the result. So, okay, if that's true, I'm going to take one part of this and I'm going to build on it. And that is, uh, if that goes on and is positive, then people uh, consider it to have been a true finding, even if it was not uh, reproduced. If the finding is not robust, precise replication might be required, but who's going to want to do that? Who's going to want to spend their time replicating something they don't view as very important or very robust? And there's no one responsible for doing that. Although there have been people who've recently made the claim, perhaps we need an old new institute at NIH that's just there to reproduce NIH funded studies. I don't think that's a good idea, but this is the context of what we're dealing with. So the spectrum of reproducibility is, you know, on the right, you got complete irreproducibility, largely irreproducible, and then, you know, moving to the better side on the left. Uh, how, common is irreproducibility? Well, we obviously don't know because the only way you would really know is to take a large representative sample and expose it to fully, uh, you know, uh, clear efforts to reproduce. And we don't have that except in one instance. Uh, it appears to be increasing 
uh, as judged by research watchdogs of various kinds, the press, biopharmaceutical companies and funding agencies, and also many concerned scientists are just saying, gee, compared to when I was younger, you know, we seem to be seeing more of this issue now. Uh, this really uh, got into the swing of things uh, uh, through many conversations that all of us were hearing with the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry over water coolers and at, uh, at um, cocktail receptions where people were saying, you know, we, we, we can't reproduce a lot of the most important studies that seem to be coming out in cell science and nature. We try to reproduce them so we can decide to work on them and we're not reproducing them. And there was a whole series of papers. Uh, the most famous one is the one by uh, Begley came out of Amgen where they said, hey, we took, I forget the exact number, 60, 70 papers and we tried to reproduce them with smart scientists and a lot of money and good uh, techniques. And we can only reproduce, I think they said 11%. Uh, now, of course, they didn't show the data. Normally, if you're a scientist, you want to be able to look, well, what did you do? Show me how you did it. Uh, so even if that accounts for somewhat of an overestimate, it's kind of depressing that they couldn't reproduce more than 11% of these papers, some of which were coming out of laboratories, you know, within a few thousand feet of this uh, podium. So, uh, and then other companies had similar things, maybe at a somewhat lower rate, 50, 60%. Uh, but that's the story. And that's what I was hearing for many years from many people in industry. We also now have people who take the reproducibility of science as their professional goal. So John Ioannidis is a wonderful uh, physician scientist whose focus is on uh, why we let so many bad papers get published. And he had his most, I think, cited paper is the one from 2005, why most published research findings are false. This has been cited thousands of times. And what he does there, he doesn't actually try to reproduce any studies. He just looks at many studies. He looks at how they did their statistical analysis, how they did their sampling. And just from the papers themselves and on first principles of statistical analysis, he, and also putting into the picture publication bias, that the negative studies don't get published, the positive ones do, he came to this conclusion that most findings that are published are false. Then uh, you now have uh, folks like Ivan Oransky, he runs an uh, organization called Retraction Watch. He's an interesting guy. He used to be an investigative reporter for the Harvard Crimson when he was an undergraduate, then became a science writer, and now full-time, I believe, runs Retraction Watch. And if you want to keep your eye on the pulse of this field, just sign up to get the daily email from Retraction Watch. He's watching. <laughs> uh, so, um, gee, I think I'm going the wrong direction here. So uh, now, I, I, this is really the meat of the subject, but I'm going to just flit over it because I don't have the time. But I'll say these are my views of the causes of the problem. First, and perhaps most important, poor training and experimental methodology in the design, the statistics, the use of scientific inference, the failure to get rid of observer bias that can be taken care of if you know how to do it, and the lack of double blind or internal replication from laboratories. This is a big hunk, and this is something we need to address. Uh, poorly characterized reagents. I won't say anything more, except you'll hear about it uh, after my talk, but this is huge. There are so many reagents, antibodies, small molecules that have been shown to not accurately represent what they're supposed to, and hundreds or thousands of papers come out and are never retracted using those false reagents. What does that do to our understanding of science? They never get retracted. Oh, oh I'm sorry, we realized our reagent that's a key reagent didn't work. Uh, we just leave the paper there. Uh, then, uh, you know, what's the quality of the oversight and mentorship that's, that's spotty, uh, especially over the area of selective reporting, which I'll come back to. And then so much of research today is complex interdisciplinary collaborations where people may have expertise in one area, world leading expertise, but they may be densely unaware of what's going on in some other area that becomes a part of their paper. So therefore they become unable to judge when there's a problem. Shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, and then uh, the peer review and publishing system, which I'll spend a couple of minutes on. So how do journals contribute to the problem? And now I'm just gonna make my own opinions and assertions that the criteria for publication, especially in the famous you know, elite journals, is more for impact than the truth. Now they'll tell you the truth is critical, but 
uh, impact perhaps even more than truth uh, in some instances. Excessive interest in novelty, impact, and buzz. We all have experienced this. Insufficient interest in confirmation, refutation, or important extensions of published work. This leads to publication bias. Many people, and I can tell you from my own lab over the years, when you, when you look to see whether you can reproduce someone's work because you have some questions about it and you don't find it, who are you going to have spend six months working on that project and then fight with the journal to try to publish it? So these things don't get published, even though we all know that so many of these findings are just not true, even though they came out in Cell Science and Nature. And then editorial requests for more and specific data. This is an, a trend that is beyond what it used to be. That is, you're in discussions with a journal, especially the big ones, about a paper, and they say, yeah, we might like it, but you need to do this like you have to show this result. Just think of that as an incentive and how that affects behaviors of people who are at the edge of what they should be doing. Okay, some other issues with peer review that I'll take up just in an instant, but I'm thinking a lot about this, is that the whole process is hidden and secretive. The journal runs the process, and for most journals, the reviews are not part of the public record, and the reviewers are not part of the public record. And this limits our ability to judge how well the process is working. We just can't, there's no data to work with. We can only judge, oh, how did they publish that paper? But then what do you do with that? Uh, too slow, uh, this is another issue. Um, sometimes it's papers have been written, it can be a year, year and a half of trying to fight to get a paper published, during which time there's nothing out there disconnect between the interests of the deciders or the editors and the reviewers. I've seen this as a reviewer and I've seen it as an editor and uh, inadequate expertise in, that can occur in some interdisciplinary studies. Uh, so here are some things that could uh, make that better. One is, uh, and I strongly advocate this, make the reviews publicly available and citable. Only 2% of journals do that. Now I can see zero argument in the digital age for not doing that. Uh, eLife gives a consensus review. This is helpful because it tends to wipe out some of the uh, complications of, you know, outlier reviewers. And then I think all the versions should be kept online and the goal is accountability and less bias. Uh, should reviewer identity be disclosed? I only have a couple of minutes left, so I'll say there's an argument about that. Most people start off thinking, no, they have to be anonymous. I am now increasingly trying to make the argument that yes, there's a trade-off, but we're way better off if the reviewers are known and are accountable for their reviews. And uh, I, I actually can't even see the other argument anymore. Maybe I'm blind to it. Uh, so is there a role for preprints? The answer is yes. They're rapidly increasing in their application. Uh, and uh, you can get rapid feedback. I know of people who've gotten jobs coming out of labs before their real paper, quote unquote, has been published based on their preprints. Uh, they can get really good feedback. They can be cited. You know, are there concerns that people will put junk out there that hasn't been reviewed uh, and therefore is terrible? I think the answer is right. So far, we haven't seen much of that in the, in the preprint world. So we have the, the top line journals here. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, some of those journals are the ones that have the most their reproducibility. When you do a reproducibility impact factor, that is uh, irreproducibility versus papers published. You can see the leading ones in the upper right. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that they just are bad at judging papers. Those journals get more exposure, therefore more people may want to pay attention to them and check them out. Uh, more, but they also have more pressure to be exciting and generate buzz. And I know of instances in this school where papers have come out under that circumstances that ended up having to be uh, questioned. It, uh, retractions are rising uh, and they're continuing to rise. Uh, journals and PIs don't like to have retractions. We know of instances where we have asked the journal to retract the paper because we found out at Harvard Medical School that there was a problem and the journals fight us over retracting the paper. It was shocking to me. Uh, one reason is it's uh, statistically over the last 10 years associated with misconduct. And people say, wait a minute, I'm not admitting misconduct. It's just wrong. <laughs> well, so we need to have a different kind of retraction that is not linked to misconduct. There are new journals coming out. I hope and expect that some of them will uh, become important, but I don't have any short term uh, views that they're going to displace uh, the ones at the top. Uh, this paper, I, if you haven't read it, you should read it by Bill Kalin from Harvard Medical School, 
winner of the Lasker Award, among other awards. And he had this article in Nature called Publish Houses of Brick, Not Mansions of Straw. And he makes the point really rather beautifully that the two or three papers on which are the basis for his winning the Lasker Award, he would never be able to publish today in any leading journal because they would have wanted so much more, even though these were clearly the basis for him winning a major award and perhaps others in the future. There are far too many mansions of straw. People try to build it up to make it look like a mansion. And uh, in fact, what they're doing is something that building something that could be blown down with a good, strong breath. Uh, now I'm going to just end up with uh, uh, the other causes of reproducibility, that is inappropriate response to external incentives, uh, seeking grants, promotions, fame, financial gain, all the things that people ideally want to have for themselves, leads to cutting corners, selective reporting, and this blends into more explicit manipulation and misconduct. Uh, and this the second category is explicit ethical lapses. We all know and have read about, you know, uh, sociopaths who come into laboratories and can fool even really smart uh, PIs or, you know, it's not that common that you have a PI as that kind of a sociopath, but often it's someone coming into a lab and they can fool people and uh, just keep your eye on the newspaper as you read about uh, those stories. Uh, my key point here is, uh, uh, if something is too good to be true, you should view it as possibly not true and have your work uh, reproduced. Uh, and the toughest problem as we talk about misconduct, which I'll end up with in 30 seconds, is we have three categories, making up data, fabrication, manipulating data, falsification, and plagiarism. Uh, it's a small part of the reproducibility problem, but the toughest part is where you get into the fuzzy border between what I'll call falsification and questionable research practices. How do you, how are you taught to and how do you make decisions about what to put in a paper and what to leave out that leaves the wrong impression that then leads to things not being reproducible. Finally, it's not over with acceptance. Uh, despite what may sometimes feel like publishing papers is not the goal of science. Uh, you know, once you publish, then all the really interesting stuff happens uh, and you can end up on the left where everyone says you're great and your career takes off and you can end up on the right where people are saying, I don't know what's coming out of that laboratory uh, and you might even be investigated. Uh, so what can we do about it? Uh, I think this is my last slide or just about, uh, and that is we have to get serious about it. Too many successful scientists don't want to be bothered with this. They say, why, why are you talking about this, Jeff? You know, you'll just make people not want to give us more funds. Uh, and, um, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, we need to have better training. We need to have good, what we would call in medicine, mortality and morbidity conferences. Take a look at papers and really take them apart uh, for the purposes of learning about reproducibility. Stress the importance of open data. Could have a whole talk on that. Then the other thing is to modify the culture of research, more respect and rewards for people whose work is, is uh, you know, shown to be true and less for those whose work isn't. Uh, we see exceptions to that rule every day. And culture responds more to actions than words. Just talking about it isn't going to work. You, uh, you have to be able to be exposed to this. And it should then affect appointments, promotions, and rewards. So final uh, thing is you've got a lot of parts of the ecosystem and they all interact and the goal in the end is accountability and aligning incentives of all these different organizations and I'll end by saying I hope I haven't made you too depressed about bioscience research today so I'll save myself by saying we're part of a great enterprise we have to be proud of that we should be proud of it the good outweighs the bad to a massive extent even though I've been talking about the bad and our goal is to be better and make the product better and may your research be both important and reproducible. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving us that overview. Um, we have time for just a few questions. If anyone in the audience wants to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that talk, Jeff. Uh, my question would be, so being that you came from a position as dean of the faculty of medicine, yep. how much is this discussed within academia right now, within your peers were, as you talk to them as the dean, how much you can push that, and what's the reception? Yeah. Um, 
what I would say, I'm not the dean anymore, which is why I'm talking about this now, right? So <laughs> deans have a hard time making this a big issue because simultaneously they're raising money from the government, from donors. They want to tell the positive story. They don't want to say, oh, maybe half of what we publish is not true. I mean, so deans in their public persona and presidents tend not to do this. Uh, on the other hand, they're all worried about it and they are trying to figure out what they can do. The problem there is that they can only do so much because they don't control everything. Having, you know, been in labs, you're all in labs, you know, those are run by the PIs of the lab. You can't just tell them what to do. You can try to get, make some educational programs. You can try to get some efforts that will uh, get out beyond what's the problem in individual laboratories. Some of this needs to address the principal investigators, some of whom are not adequately trained in experimental design themselves. They've gotten pretty far without it, but then they get into some new area and you know they're, they're kind of a little lost. So it's, as I said in another talk that I gave on this subject, you know, my, my goal when I started thinking about this was to approach it the way a physician scientist approaches a disease. But here's the thought. Between the time that I started doing metabolic research and today, we have like massive new knowledge about disease and pathways and how to influence them. And the diseases that I'm interested in are more prevalent today than they were when I started diabetes and obesity. So just applying this kind of rigor doesn't mean you can solve it. So I don't want to leave anyone with the idea that we're ready to solve it, but that doesn't mean we can't or shouldn't, you know, push hard on it. Yes. So, I mean, as a professor, you're not in the lab doing the experiments, and if somebody shows you some data and you want to reproduce it, and it's, you know, whether the person's intentionally doing something wrong or accidentally, yep. potentially, um, it seems like it's difficult from our current incentive system to find another person to reproduce it, because the, the first person is the first author and kind of owns yep. it. Yep. So it's sort of a weird and awkward system to, it, to get that second piece of data as a professor. It's a weird and awkward system to be sure, but I believe not in every instance does everything need to be checked. But now I'm looking back at cases that I've known, cases that I saw while I was dean, and some of which still haven't you know, come to the public awareness, that they were issues where a PI should have seen that this was not likely to be true, or at least had to be tested before they put it out there. Right. And under those circumstances, if you as a responsible PI can't get someone, you don't have to repeat a year's worth of work, but you have to repeat some key things. And I just don't accept that that's impossible to do. Yeah, I, mean, I wonder what like, we can do for education of the PI for incentive systems yes. within the groups to help. Yes. Get yeah, no, it's a great point. And I think we need to work on that. Yep. We have time for one more. And can you repeat the question? OK, yes. Um, so what are your thoughts on this problem in fields that are highly competitive where there's a lot of pressure to get scooped if you don't like put the idea out there first rather than having a very complete story? So the question is, what recommendations do I have for competitive fields? Not that they all aren't competitive, but okay, the most competitive fields where people are worried about getting their ideas out there, not getting scooped and getting into the high profile journals, right? I don't have a special answer to that, except that that's what's driving a lot of this. I mean, now we're not going to go back to the more relaxed era where everyone is just sitting there drinking their mint juleps and thinking about when they're going to finally publish their work. There's huge competition. There's internal competition to get grants, to get promoted, to get your student the next job and all the rest. Those are real. But I think everyone just needs to be sensitized to the fact that if in the process of responding to those things, you are making your work something that will be viewed as untrue within six months, a year, two years, or three years, that that's too big a risk. So step back, people have to say, are we really ready? Is there anything we want to do before we uh, put this forward and try to sell it to the journal? So I don't have a simple answer, but awareness is the number one thing. Uh, and um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
All right. Um, next, we have Dr. Susanna Beckley, who is an outreach scientist at AdGene, the nonprofit plasmid repository. She received her master's in biomedicine from the Karolinska Institute and went on to receive a PhD from this institute for her studies on the functional, molecular, and evolutional aspects of immune evasion strategies evolved by human viruses. She has been at AdGene since early 2017. Take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, as you just heard, my name is Susanna Bechle. I'm an outreach scientist at Agin, and one of my major tasks in my job is to help scientists share reagents. So as we just have heard from Dr. Flyer about irreproducibility and some suggestions on how to improve the situation, I'd like to continue in this uh, mode of focusing on solutions, and I'd like to uh, introduce three ways to improve reproducibility. First, by lowering barriers to repetition. Second, by open data reporting. And third, by better experimental design. All right, so let's start with lowering barriers to repetition. So this graph just represents uh, time and money spent on science and the scientific progress. So initial experiments probably take least cost and least time to create data, but the more and more scientists try to follow up on studies and repeat experiments, the more money and time is spent on a, a specific finding. And of course, this investment peaks when, then there are, when the data is attempted to be replicated for clinical applications. And we've heard a little bit of this before as well. So really, what could happen if we had easier access to reagents, protocols, code, and methods that allow us to do repetitions more easily? and actually reducing time and cost. This clearly won't change the system, but at least it will lower the bar to, do, to repeat. All right, so I'd like to introduce as a first, uh, first solution to lower the barriers by reagent repositories. And, and the uh, repository I would like to talk about is Atin, so it's a plasmid repository, and that helps scientists share plasmids all over the world. So materials are searchable, they are archived, Lots of useful information is given um, in connection with this reagent at online at the plasma page. Um, and also a very thorough um, quality control pro process is applied when those reagents, before those reagent, reagents become uh, accessible. We use full plasmid sequencing so you can be sure that when you receive the plasmid that you're actually working with the reagent that was used in the original experiment and not just some, let's say, random aliquot from the freezer. So now you have the right reagent when you want to reproduce an experiment. However, you still need to do it the same way the original author has done it. And as we know, in most publications or most journals, the method section is very short and abbreviated. So not necessarily a very useful protocol to actually do the experiment. Um, so well annotated and comprehensive protocols are needed to replicate in a, in the, in a useful way. And protocols that oh, allows you to post um, protocols and just hands-on hands -on advice how to repeat an experiment. I'd like to also point out uh, that Agin also allows you to upload protocols as a, in combination with, uh, with plasma information. So this is another way you can find information about this. And as, as part of our um, drive initiative to enable and promote reproducibility, Agin is providing open access video protocols of uh, most commonly used lab methods, just to make sure that you have uh, hands-on advice and just visualization of very, very often used methods that is maybe hard to convey in a written format. And so all of these incentives try to help you practice and allow best, best, um, best procedures and just standardized methods. So now we have the reagent, we have the right protocols, we're doing it and we received some data. Now it comes to the analysis part. So as we know, data analysis is super complex. We often use code, we use programs to analyze, and it is actually not trivial how, what parameters you, you use, what algorithms you do. So in the end of the day, if you don't have the same approach of analyzing, you might not um, end up with the same result, even though you did everything else the same way. So code repositories such as Code Oceans play a really important role that allow scientists uh, to use the same parameters and the same algorithms as were used in the original paper. Lastly, I'd like to point out that, of course, journal policies, as we have heard previously as well, play a really important role. We have done everything. We have repeated the, the, 
um, experiment, but we still need to be able to get it out there and to get it uh, to the scientific community. So journal policies really need to be more supportive, supportive and inviting to repeated experiments, as well as positive and negative data. All right, so I just talked about um, more supportive journal policies, and this is part of the formal publication process. But I think we can also think of more um, open and open data reporting policies that allow us to add additional data, not just in the formal uh, publication process. So this is what I talk about. We also just heard about this. A lot of scientists may work on similar questions, may use similar, similar methods and similar reagents, but not all of them come to the same result. However, in the way it is currently, most likely the innovative and positive result is being published. So how would this affect the scientific community if we actually are able to look at all results and not just the published positive results? So if we get access to all the data that has actually been created asking this question using these reagents. So I'd like to focus on broader informal communication now. And the first example here is a blog, a blog post or, or just people writing about their scientific experience. And here we have a post from, from the Edging blog, which highlights uh, at that time novel genome engineering tool, which had questionable and distributed uh, results. So this post allowed to highlight these uh, results and was a, a discussion platform really um, after this came out and made this information then accessible to the scientific community. Another example which was also mentioned is Retraction Watch. Um, it really is a database for retracted papers and information about them. It allows you to sign, discuss, um, comment on, on, on retracted papers as well as publish data. And I think it was in, in 2010 it was uh, started because of the fact that retraction of papers is quite a black box and a not known process. So a paper is retract retracted, that's fine, but you wouldn't hear about it that it happened unless it's a it's a big scandal and often there's also no information attached to why this was retracted was it res retracted because of what we just heard misconduct or was it retracted because of a reagent that was faulty and that's actually really really important information that maybe the scientific community <coughs> should know about so really retraction watch tries to integrate this this information and make retraction a learning experience and not just like a hush hush failure In addition to having open data reporting in an informal way, I think we should also try to find new and creative ways of uh, publishing, uh, uh, sorry, posting and disseminating, disseminating data. And one good example, I think, is Figshare, which is a digital repository where you can upload different types of, of data and files. So, for example, images, videos, data sets, um, anything that you create in the lab that is in a visual way. And you can compare, share, discover, dis uh, comment, and make this available even though it's not part of a publication yet. Another example is, um, as I mentioned before, Agin goes a long way to provide useful information with the plasmids that we um, share. So we have, of course, um, description about what the, uh, the item is used for, but also we show how this plasmids were used in other citations. So if, if a plasmid is used in a new publication, it's cited. And you can see here, for example, that the plasmid was used in what kind of concept it was used, whether it worked as expected, and also maybe if it was used in a field that is outside of your uh, scientific expertise. So maybe it was used as a tool by a totally different model in a totally different model organism or a different field. So it also allows you to broaden your scientific horizon. So we just heard about specific tools and, and single data sets and looking and uploading data in a more open way. But I think another really, really important aspect is tools to compare and combine data. So a lot of data is actually made from different data sets over time comparisons. And so, for example, ReFigure can help you to take figures and data sets from already published papers and replot them and re put them together in, in a new graph to make new comparisons, make new discover, discoveries, and also just to compare. And I think an additional interesting feature is that you can add your own data set. And thus, of course, this can be a really interesting tool for reproducibility. Another interesting example I'd like to mention here is Gapminder, 
which is also a visual visualization and blotting tool that allows you to blot data sets from socioeconomic uh, databases. So for example, here, life expectancy versus income per person. And just these kind of tools can be used to create, um, recreate ideas, hypotheses, um, use data that's already out there, but of course, also to meta-analyze data sets compared to your own data that you created. Lastly, I'd like to point out, and uh, this was brought up before as well, preprints and increased open access are very, very important parts of access to scientific findings in general. Preprints, as per definition, are manuscripts that are not as yet published and like uh, not published in a formal way. Uh, so they, they get online as a manuscript. They can be peer reviewed at that, that stage already, can use the feedback to improve, for example, data analysis, and then actually enter the um, formal publication process afterwards with peer review and publishing. In addition, I think one really important part of preprints now is that it allows you to publish, to post and upload repeated experiments. So it allows you to post um, repetition, it allows you to post negative and positive data, so it gives you more freedom in what you would like to show. And of course, this could be a way to broaden and more balance the data landscape that we have at the moment. All right, so we did the whole round from creating, recreating an experiment and, pub and making sure it gets out there via by, by preprint. I think taking a step back and starting with, okay, how do we make scientific findings from the beginning reproducible is actually looking at experimental design and going back to the beginning of the experiment. So one really interesting way by the Center for Open Science is to have a very thoughtful process how you create your experiment. So they propose a pre-registration and pre-peer reviewing process for experiments as part as a, or as a tool for reproducibility. So you would think of, a, of an experiment, write it down, post it, uh, upload it online, and pre-register pre -regi there. Uh, it gets then peer reviewed. And you can integrate this, this uh, suggestions and feedback, for example, on your statistic analysis and actually get the right sample size before you even start it. Once you have decided on what you will do, you will actually follow this as you had registered. And you also will, pub will, you will also post all the information as, as is, so if it's negative or a positive. So there's no selection bias in that way. And this is actually used um, as a concept. So the pre-registering and peer-reviewing of, of protocols and, and uh, accountability for the procedures is used in the reproducibility project in cancer biology, which is, um, which was, I think, briefly also mentioned before. So pharma companies tried to reproduce key findings in, in cancer biology, but were not really able to do that. So the reproducibility project aims to reproduce uh, key findings from high-impact publications and make these results and openly accessible. And I think the first um, studies have been have been published already. And one of the key findings, or one of the first findings and the clearest finding in the beginning was that many papers include too few details about their methods. So with, with this, uh, I'd like just to say that there are many ways research can be more reproducible, and I just introduced three of them. Agin and similar repositories have distinct roles in both promoting and enabling reproducibility. And really, instead of panicking, we should think of embracing solutions and like addressing the problem than being negative about it. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to thank, of course, the organizer for putting this together, and especially Tyler Ford, who is our reproducibility expert. <laughs> Susanna, so the $1,000, I love the monetary incentive, although it might have the uh -huh. Center for Open Science. Um, and so the, the commitment there is to publish the results, whether or not they're positive or negative. Yes. So that's what you're sort of yeah. buying by depositing your experimental design is a guarantee of exposure regardless of the outcome. Is that right? I think, as I understand it as well, that you follow the pre-designed and pre-registered setup. So you will not, as I understand, pivot much from what you decided, unless you maybe make a note or it somehow has to be handled in a very transparent way. So let's say 
I don't know, you decided to use one specific antibody, that's the one you're going to use. And there's no just pivoting and just, oh, I didn't have this other quote. So I think trying to be very thoughtful and disciplined in your approach is what they want to do. Yeah. I didn't know who was first. <laughs> I think you were first. Sorry. So, uh, completely agree. I think the yeah, SGA uh, protocols is key to improve this ability. But I also find it might be challenging for practice and science published data and move on to the project and they don't have the incentive to provide that to So, how do you drive this behavior? That is a really, I mean, that's a really good point. How to, I think the question was, if I should repeat the question. The question was, how, what incentives could you have to give to scientists to move on to maybe a new project to actually log protocols and deposit reagents or something like this? Well, it's, it's hard to say what more incentives you should give in, in addition to that. This is really the right thing to do. And in a way, you will also benefit from this if other people can take your research to the take your research and actually go to the next level, you will be cited. You'll be probably more known in the field. So I think repositories, for example, such as Agin, help you then share your reagents. You don't have to go through painful shipping out reagents yourself, right? And I think if you once uploaded your protocols IO protocol, you can annotate it, but I don't think you have to. So I don't think, I understand that this is an extra step, but at the same time, I do think for longevity of science, maybe also your own lab, Maybe you move on and you ever have to repeat a method. It's actually very smart to do that. And maybe we can instill this kind of notion of continuity and science already when we train people. <laughs> and we'll talk more about incentives during the panel, too. It's a good question. Thanks. And, yeah. Uh, what I have to spend uh, a plasmid that was deposited at, at that gene uh, to the users and the reusers report back that this uh, plasmid actually does not do what right. initially uh, published. Uh, right. And I think so, this was super short time to read the post that I, I had it as an example, but I think this was one of those cases. So depending on the, on the impact of this plasmid, if it has been already distributed, maybe it's never been requested, but if it isn't an important, um, or if it's a tool that has been used, there would be a note, there would be a note on, the, it would be first of all, not made available anymore. There would be a note on its page. And maybe if it's important, like if it's known enough, there would be some kind of blog post or some kind of communication about it. I would say there's one other big advantage to sharing is that if a plasma's been requested a hundred times, oh, yeah. cited in 40 papers, you have a pretty good confidence mm -hmm. that the plasma is close. So your first right. year graduate student might be having trouble getting their result, but it might be because it's a first year graduate mm -hmm. student and maybe they should try again. So um, one of the things about crowdsourcing, which Suzanne also mentioned, was the, the richness of that's reproducibility in itself, just sharing the reagents and getting more information on them. That's kind of the beauty of it. Same thing with protocols I know in Code Ocean. That's the beauty. If 100 people use the protocol and nobody's commented that it doesn't work, you, you have a pretty good feeling that 10 microliters really is not a type over one microliter, right? <laughs> <laughs> good question. Yep. I think a key problem with this entire system is the presence of one atomic problem. And right now, the, the major private assignment uh, way is to publish more papers published on high performance journals. And, and also, uh, we don't really have other private assignment systems. And that's why, uh, in my opinion, drives off problems, and we always publish one publish more. And I'm very disappointed to see like uh, those uh, open science uh, like clouds uh, of uh, plus they still spend tons of money to create more journals. Mm. Um, I, I think I think journals is a key problem. Like, they are they are about the hundred and eighty years ago. And that at that time it's the best way to communicate science. But right. nowadays it's not the best way anymore. And why we still publish our papers on journals? Yeah, I mean I wouldn't say journals are totally redundant. So the comment was that journal, the way journals and publications are um, incentivized, it drives part of the reproducibility problem, correct? Is that what you were saying, right? So I wouldn't disagree, <laughs> but at the same time, I think we can just embrace the fact that we can broaden and have a broader approach. Like I mentioned, have more informal ways of communicating, um, being sure that you discuss at an earlier stage, like preprints, 
Um, so I, I don't think, I think we can approach this more broadly and have a solution that way instead of just saying that it doesn't work at all by publishing in journals. And yeah, again, we'll talk more about that. Okay, perfect. <laughs> all different types of papers. That'll be great. So thank you so much. Thanks. So our final talk for this afternoon is Dr. Stephen Almo, who is a professor and the chair of the Department of Biochemistry and the professor of physiology and biophysics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He holds the Wallowick Family Foundation Chair in Immunology and is the director of Einstein's Macromolecular, Macromolecular Therapeutics Development Facility. He's also the co-founder and chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of Q Biopharma. He has authored over 300 papers and made significant contributions to our understanding of immunology, including high-resolution structural and biochemical characterization of the CTLA-4 and PD-1 immune checkpoint proteins and their ligands. And today he's here representing the Institute for Protein Innovation. I'm really excited to hear his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's a real pleasure for me to be speaking here. What you didn't say was I got my PhD at Harvard, so it's a double pleasure to be here. Uh, Jeff Flyer gave you a very high level view of the reproducibility issues. I'm gonna do just the opposite and give you an absolutely ground crawling low level view, which is really based on my experiences and observations having leadership roles in three large scale initiatives. Uh, so based on these, the way we approach intellectually reproducibility uh, is summed up here. <laughs> you can't go wrong with being paranoid, okay? Uh, I wanna share with you an old Russian proverb that was made popular by Ronald Reagan in the 80s when he was negotiating with the former Soviet Union about nuclear disarmament, which is trust but verify. I think this is good for politics, for us, mistrust, verify, and verify again. And this is a couple of themes I'm gonna to try to show you in some of our large scale initiatives that we repeatedly, we oversample to try to ensure we're delivering what we promise we're gonna deliver. And so what I wanna do now is just introduce the three programs that I've been associated with. And you can tell they're large scale initiatives because they all have beautiful logos associated with them. The New York Structural Genomics Research Consortium, this was a high throughput structure discovery machine. This was funded by the NIGMS Institute as part of their structural genomics program. The deliverables of this program were expression vectors, purified proteins, and structures. Associated with that was the Enzyme Function Initiative, again, another GM funded initiative. And here the deliverables were, again, identical to the Structural Genomics Consortium, but in addition to proteins, expression vectors, and structures, were functional annotations. The goal here was to develop novel approaches to actually identify new enzyme activities and metabolic functions. Uh, finally, the last half of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about this new initiative I've been involved with, which is the Institute for Protein Innovation. And this is located, I think, about 300 feet in that direction in the Harvard Institute for Medicine. And this is a high throughput foundry for the development of highly validated, highly characterized antibodies which will be a topic of interest, I think. So what I wanna do is sort of focus on NYSGRC and the Enzyme Function Initiative and just give you an idea about what the workflow is like for these processes. So again, this is intentionally unreadable, and I assure you this is an abbreviated version of all the processes involved in target identification through structure determination, crystallographically predominantly, and functional annotation. So here I've given you a somewhat more palatable version the first step in this entire pipeline is target selection, not surprisingly. And target selection itself seems simple. In fact, it's wrought with problems. What I'm showing you here is a, the number of entries in the Tremble database, protein sequences as a function of time. And as of today, there are about 15 million protein sequences in the Tremble database. So those are proteins. Now, if you compare those to the number of protein sequences that have manually curated, experimentally supported functional annotations. It... <laughs> Excellent, okay. Uh, so there's clearly an issue. And so in terms of trying to do metabolic reconstruction, developing new metabolically capable organisms, this is a huge problem, but this has gotta be saved for another day because this is 
way too large an issue to talk about today. What I want to do is turn back to our pipeline after target selection, which you see as a challenge. There's construct design. There's expression vector construction. We have a lot of automation, and automation is great because it automatically does what you tell it. It reduces manual errors. It also reports back in tabular form in an easy format, something that you can store and archive. Uh, generally, all of our cloning is done in 96-well format by ligation independent cloning. We then take those transformants and we look at small scale expression validation in less than an ML in 96-well deep well blocks, which of these constructs looks like it's going to express. We then, I should say, at this point, small scale expression vector construction, everything is sequenced, not surprisingly. We then take our small scale expression validated clones, we scale them up between one to two liters. You'll notice everything is barcoded as it has to be. What we do to, for certainty from these large scale fermentations, we take an aliquot, we sequence the DNA to make sure we've got the right colonies in the right bottles. We then have high throughput purification protocols. Uh, after we've purified hundreds of proteins, then this is the key part, and actually in some ways the most time consuming part, distribution of these reagents to the other members of the consortia, as well as archiving in archives such as the Arizona State Materials Repository and AdGene. And over the past decade or so, we've contributed about 16,000 expression vectors, both E. coli and mammalian based to these repositories. So again, they're there for posterity. And that's the key is not to lose these materials. In some of our programs, we then do crystallization, data collection, structure determination, structure validation, and then deposition to the protein database. And I'll just point out as an aside, one of the biggest shortcomings currently is there is nowhere to archive your primary X-ray diffraction data. It's all stored in individually labs, individual labs for the most part, potentially a problem. And I'll just highlight, while there are fewer and fewer real mistakes in crystallography now, there are still some extremely prominent mistakes that are continually occurring. And these can really disrupt a field people providing grants for NIH study sections that don't get funded because they don't correspond or they're not coincident with the incorrectly published crystal structure. So that's a huge problem. So what I want to do is move on. How do we manage all of these data types? And what I'm going to show you is our LIMS system that we've employed, our laboratory information system. And we were fortunate enough during our structural genomics period to work with Structural Genomics, a small biotech company in San Diego, which was bought by Eli Lilly in part because of their exceptionally good limb system. So this is the front page of the limb system, extremely clean, clean, extremely neat. You can find everything you want to look at. This limb system is great for storing expression constructs. It's great for storing profiles from size exclusion columns, purification gels, tells you concentrations before and after gels, everything you'd want to archive. It also gives you uh, mass spectrometric data that's easily archived. In this case, it's telling us that our protein has seven methionines that we've replaced with selenium to help us determine the structure. Uh, we get experimentally observed and predicted experimental weights. It all gives us a validation as to whether we've got the right protein or we've got all of the right protein and not a proteolytic fragment. Uh, crystallization is done robotically. They're screened robotically and all this data is archived in the Eli Lilly limb system. Critical, this is our working product. Uh, this is the inside of the synchrotron beam line that was run and continue to be run by Eli Lilly. This is as complex an experiment as you can imagine. Behind the wall is an electron accelerator, accelerates electrons to near the speed of light. You take those X-rays, you hit crystals, collect diffraction patterns, determine structures. This is complex. But because Eli Lilly had control of both the limb system and the beam line, all of the metadata associated with this experiment was captured. And here I'm just showing you some, some of this metadata. What is the energy of the x-rays? What were the exposures of x-rays on the crystals when we screened them, ultimately collecting beautiful diffraction data, which ultimately resulted in the structure. So now, what a point I'm making here is, if you're going to do high throughput structural determination or functional annotation, or DNA sequencing, as you're all aware, you need an unassailable limb system. So the data management and process control that this limb system provided was 
just you couldn't live without it. So it seamlessly integrated numerous data types, and that's the key. It established workflows. That is, it would look at which genes actually gave you reasonable, actionable amounts of protein expression. You come in the next day, it would tell you what to carry forward for large-scale expression. So it ran the process. Uh, it was completely searchable. This is a key. Again, NIH loves quarterly and annual reports, and you also like to look for correlations within your data. This complete searchability, absolutely critical. Uh, it rapidly accepted new data structures. If at some point you wanted to add fluorescence spectroscopy, EPR, NMR, it was easily manipulated to add these additional data types. Uh, and it enabled easy project administration and oversight. Me, the person not doing the work, could readily see what each individual investigator in the team was doing. So that's the, the strong points. The problem with it is Eli Lilly invested $8 million over a number of years to develop this limb system. This is just not approachable in the typical laboratory setting. So again, I think one of our real challenges, how can we get this level of data flow process capture and analysis in the average lab? And this is actually a very crude diagram that I want to present, <laughs> but I think it's true. Uh, small, young labs have got complete control of the reagents because they're looking in very focused, small, particular programs. As the lab gets larger and larger and larger, uh, and we've all experienced this, it becomes much harder to track what's going on. More people in and out of the same aliquot of DNA more people doing multiple projects, sharing reagents. And I should say, as part of our structural genomics program, we received DNA expression vectors from collaborators and outside in laboratories. The first thing we did was sequence. And what I can tell you is there was a complete correlation between the prominence of the laboratory and the number of wrong <laughs> sequences. You would be shocked what some of your colleagues have been working on, okay? <laughs> It's not funny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the mature labs, as you grow even larger and larger, when you have very large initiatives of the kind I've described, you have the resources you can put together this kind of laboratory management system. So again, the challenge, and I don't know what the answer is, the challenge is how do we take some of the lessons we've learned in these large scale programs and actually utilize them for the individual lab, but the community of researchers in particular areas of endeavor. So what I want to do with that sort of open-ended proposition is moved to the protein, is the Institute for Protein Innovation. And as I've said, this is really a high throughput synthetic antibody discovery platform. And I wanna just describe our basic platform. So the Institute for Protein Innovation uh, is in the Harvard Institute of Medicine, as I've said, you know, and the most successful aspect of this is where we're located. We're surrounded, you know, we can't possibly fail, right? <laughs> you can take, you can write that down. So the, the IPI, the IPI is a nonprofit research institute that was founded about a year and a half ago by Tim Springer. And the goal was to take the realization that protein science today is really underrepresented relative to genomics. And can we grow protein science to really recognize the promise of genomics? Ultimately, you're gonna need drugs. And drugs can be small molecules or frequently biologics, large biological proteins such as antibodies. And we wanted to create a large scale, openly available resource for, for protein technology. And the two key people I'm gonna to plug today, Joe Jardine, our head of antibody discovery, and James Love, who's the chief operating officer of the Institute for Protein Innovation. James is also in charge of our high throughput protein production platform. We've got exceptional capabilities in making proteins and exceptional capabilities in antibody discovery. So just to show you, as of April, that last month we moved into our new space, we've got an enormous amount of automation, again, which is gonna be critical for the high throughput capabilities that we'd like to address. Uh, it also allows for data capture in an extremely efficient way and for experimental design in a very efficient way. So I'm not gonna talk about our limb system because we will have a high powered limb system to capture all of this data. What I wanna do is just look in a little bit of detail at the antibody reproducibility crisis and everyone's familiar with this. I'm not gonna go over the fact it's close to a billion dollars in wasted funds. Half of the studies are considered to be wrong depending on who you talk to. Uh, we can do better. And what I'd like to do 
is really described. Oh, Jeff, you want a picture? Yes. Please take a picture. <laughs> you got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the antibody initiative that we're supporting really open source antibodies. And in our case, we're focusing all human secreted and cell surface molecules. We want the secretome of both humans, mouse, and zebrafish as model systems. So again, this is a hugely ambitious goal, but we think we can approach it. And so we're gonna produce open source recombinant antibodies against every protein in the extracellular proteome. Uh, and these antibodies will function both as research tool compounds and hopefully as leads for potential therapeutic application. So the first and most important part of generating an antibody is Bingo, antigen. So our philosophy is, again, especially since we're looking at secreted and integral membrane proteins, all of our antigen production takes place in mammalian expression systems so we can get as close to possible to the appropriate post-translational modification, glycosylation, sulfation, et cetera, disulfide bond formation and processing. What I'm showing here are 24 members of the immunoglobulin superfamily, our first 24 target set. Uh, and what you'll notice is instead of beautiful, discrete, clean bands, these are long, smeary bands, which you would typically hate, but these represent the ensemble of glycosylation products that would be present to some extent in naturally occurring protein. And again, we acknowledge the fact that we're using HEC and CHO cells. These will not be appropriate for every protein. They will not support proteolytic processing or unusual rare modifications present in specific organ-derived cells but on a high throughput level, it's as close as we can get. So that's the protein level. Antigens are always mammalian expressed. This is a quick interview, or excuse me, introduction to our surface display program on yeast. So we're using yeast cell surface display where we're actually displaying FABs. And this FAB construct is attached to this yeast cell surface through a well noted used AGA1, AGA2 system. We've got the heavy chain, and the light chain of the antibody, each of those two chains is attached to a, an epitope where we can actually query the amount of cell surface expression of the heavy and light chain with a fluorescent antibody. And that's critical because we want to make sure we're selecting yeast expressing both heavy and light chain. We then query this with a target molecule that's biotinylated. And then we have strept avidin Fluor fluorescently labeled streptavidin that tells us the sur surface density of the target antigen, as well as antibodies telling us, are we expressing in intact two-chain FABs? So again, we're looking in our fact sort for a triple positive event, okay? And I'll just say our synthetic yeast antibody library has a diversity of about 10 to the 10, and all of our diversity is built into CDR3 of the heavy chain. And what we've done is we've varied the length of this construct from between 10 to 20 amino acids. So the length, as well as the amino acid composition have been taken from high throughput sequencing of a number of human repertoires for antibodies. So again, we're trying to reproduce in our synthetic library, the kind of repertoire that's actually occurring in nature in humans, okay? So that's our system. So just to look in a little more detail, our first fact sort, so now we're looking for triple positives that have got our fluorescently labeled antigen bound to the yeast. We take the population with the highest staining. We grow those up because we've now got a direct linkage between genotype and phenotype. We rescreen at going from 100 nanomolar, where we pick up about 1,000 clones. If we drop the concentration of antigen to 20 nanomolar, we're going to be selectively looking at higher affinity reagents we go down to about 300 unique clones. In another round of amplification, we wind up with about 80 unique clones with a four nanomolar or so affinity. And what I'm showing below here, each symbol represents a distinct CDR3 sequence. And what's plotted on the y-axis is the frequency. So as you go from high to intermediate to low concentration of target antigen, you're increasing the relative rate Num the relative number of highly represented clones. And again, our goal is not to make an antibody. We want to make a suite of between 10 and 20 antibodies 
per antigen. What we'd like to do is cover the entire epitopic diversity of that given target. And this gives us the maximal chance of getting both tool compounds that do not block function, but also function blocking antibodies that might be useful as therapeutic leads. Okay, so what I want to do is really end with my favorite validation assay. And again, I've shown you how we're going about making these, but the hard part I've left is how do you validate that they're monospecific, high affinity, they really hit the target you want. And again, there are a huge number of assays. This is my particular favorite. Uh, it's a very simple facts-based assay. If we express our protein antigen on the cell surface of a hex cell as a red fluorescent protein, and then come in with our antibody labeled, say, green, we're going to simply look for red-green conjugates. And this is a trivial facts assay that everybody does. But what we've done is we've reduce this assay to a 96 well and now a 384 well format where we can express, for example, all 400 members of the human immunoglobulin superfamily and ask, does a particular antibody that we've raised against one of those Ig superfamily members exclusively and selectively bind only that or is it promiscuous in its recognition? So what I'm going to do is just show you here. This is 100 members of the Ig superfamily as green fluorescent proteins the height of the green bar is correlates with the level of expression of those target molecules on the hex cell. If we now challenge each one of these cells with soluble red fluorescent antibody that we've raised, raised against a pro protein called HVM, the herpes viral en entry medi mediator, you'll see we only pick up one, two, three. These three are all HVEM. There's essentially no off-target binding. And there's a special bonus. This particular antibody binds both the mouse and the human orthologs. Okay, so one of our goals in the IPI is to actually generate cross-reactive antibodies because that provides you a tool that you can use in a model system, mouse or otherwise, or zebrafish, but you could use the same reagent that you validate in a preclinical model to potentially take forward as a lead therapeutic. And again, that's not always easy because you'll appreciate the more cross-reactivity you have in terms of different species, the lower the affinities might be, but it's certainly possible and that's our goal. So what I wanna do is just end up by summarizing okay, the antibody initiative. Uh, one of the keys to using <laughs> yeast surface display is there's no immune tolerance. One of the challenges with immunizing a mouse with an, anti with an antigen is that if there's high sequence similarity between the human and mouse proteins, you're going to have a very hard time identifying antibodies against the protein in general. And in particular, you'll have a difficult time identifying antibodies that bind to the binding surface, the functional part of that antibody, because that is likely to be the most highly conserved region of the protein. Yeast display completely does away with immune tolerance. I've told you that we're exclusively using mammalian expression to generate our antigens. We're also carefully preparing antigens in different conformational states, such as GPCRs bound to pro small molecules or small proteins designed to push them into particular conformational states that we'll then use in our selection. Uh, critically, we're going to generate a suite of monoclonal antibodies for each antigen, both tools and potentially therapeutic leads. The antibodies will be selected when appropriate for cross-species reactivity. And again, we also have a program where we're trying to look not just for binding to the normal antigen, the native antigen, but binding to formal, formal and fixed versions of that antigen to use in sections in the clinic for immunohistochemistry. So again, it's challenging, but with the yeast display library, it's completely doable because you can easily select against the right, the, current, the initial antigen, formal and fixed antigen, and switch back and forth, and at the end result in a bispecific antibody, if you will, that can recognize both native as well as formal and fixed reagents. Uh, it's easy to engineer and modify the properties. For example, it's easy to change the effector region, the FC of the antibody, to provide any type of effector function you might want for either preclinical or potentially therapeutic leads. Uh, we're planning a wide number of community workshops to validate these affinity reagents. You can imagine if we're gonna make hundreds of antigens per year, times 20 antibodies per antigen, that is more than any one lab can do. It's more than we want to do. But what we can do is identify the correct laboratories 
both nationally and internationally who are interested in those specific reagents and then they will do the validation themselves. They're invested in those new reagents and then report those back and make those results publicly available. Finally, what I really want to underscore is our entire enterprise is open source. All of the sequences of the antigens and of the antibodies will be publicly available in open resources. The expression vectors for the antigens and antibodies will be deposited in repositories that are accessible for the public to get their hands on. So with that, I'll just put up the last slide. Uh, this is our website, proteininnovation.org, my email address, and we would love to recruit new customers and collaborators from this audience. So thank you so much. So speaking as someone who I did about five experiments on Humira about 20 years ago, mm. um, are you going to evolve? Is there going to be an evolution step? Or are you hoping that the library is complex enough to get mm. high, high enough affinity antibodies for the agents? I understand you'd have to evolve for therapeutics. Right. But. So the first goal, our library at present is all diversified in CDR3. Once we find lead candidates there, which might be tens of nanomolar if we're lucky, we can then evolve those further. At, okay. We have those technologies and we're developing new libraries that will allow us to readily move forward. To I don't think you'll get that many uh, at that. Absolutely. The one thing I didn't mention was that the diversity of the library at present is about 10 to the 10, yeah. which is really quite good, but there's no guarantee you're going to find the picomolar antibody. Certainly additional, as needed, additional evolutionary steps required. Cool. Uh, more of a technical question. As you mentioned, uh, many of these proteins are glycosyl glycosylated. Uh, how do you know which form of glycosylation um, the antibody might be uh, specific for? Um, since there's like a huge range of mm -hmm. types of glycosylation uh, proteins, or pro types of proteins with different types of glycosylation, you want to know where my antibody is specific for. Right. So I'll give you a pragmatic answer. Uh, the reason we're making suites of antibodies, 10, 20 or more antibodies, is with that problem in mind. We hope that we identify antibodies that have different specificities for different post-translational modifications. That's really beyond our ability to validate and characterize, but that's why the community-wide symposia and workshops are going to be critical. The people for which that's a really important point are now going to have a suite of potential reagents. They're motivated to answer that question. And again, there's just so much one institute, even at large scale, can do. So we really need the community. What Yeah, so the question was, what incentives have we provided to our customers to come back and report on their validation? Uh, so. We are just at the point we're now starting to make antibodies, but Tim Springer, who is actually the founder, has been extremely successful in running these kinds of validation workshops in the past. And there's actually people sign that we're gonna provide you with this reagent. In return, you will report on what you found. And Tim in his office, if you're walking to his office, he's got about 11 volumes of just raw data that have been published on a huge number of antibodies from the cluster of differentiation antibodies, CD1 through CDX100. And again, that has worked amazingly well, and we're hoping that that same paradigm will carry forward. Again, we're not providing a cash incentive. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. A absolutely. So, so again, in some sense, it will be self-selecting. The people who really want to participate will be future customers as well. So. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers again. They really stayed on time and also gave wonderful talks. So thank you for that. <laughs> now we're going to transition into the panel portion of the event. Uh, we're just going to move the camera and put our
And the video will also be posted at a later point so you can visit any of these conversations. Started. I'm going to let the panelists actually introduce themselves and tell you um, where they're coming from and also sort of the level of awareness and concern about reproducibility within your um, area of work. So why don't we start here with Pamela. I'm Pam Hines. I am an editor at Science Magazine. And um, let me just remind you that Science is published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. AAAS, which is a nonprofit membership association. The issue of reproducibility is of enormous importance to Science Magazine, to AAAS, and to the publishing universe as a whole. Journals don't want to publish things that are wrong, things that won't stand up. It's incredibly important that the work be reproducible. Uh, we have a couple of programs in place that we're working towards, and should I talk about them now or move on? Okay, okay. Two programs that AAAS is, has in, in place, one is already in place and one will start this summer, address what I think is uh, an extremely important aspect of this problem, which Dr. Flyer mentioned, and, and that is the uh, confidence of the public. When the public sees that a certain research result is not replicable or, you know, five years ago they said drink red wine, today they say don't, uh, french fries are better for you now, you know, what is the public going to do with this? They have other things to do. They are not the experts on this like, like you are. There's a communication problem that needs to be addressed between the, the, the natural course of scientific discovery, which is trial and error. We do the best we can with the knowledge we have at the moment. Future discoveries help us refine that knowledge. We learn a little bit more. We do a little bit better in the future. The public, meanwhile, comes into that process at, at one point, you know, usually. Should I drink red wine tonight or not? And they want the answer, the right answer, right then, right there. And, and if such persons were to go out into the literature, they would see things that say yes, things that say no, and they would discover unreproducible things. The programs that AAAS is putting in place now are to help with that communication problem, to help filter the, the unevenness of the natural course of scientific research before it turns into a public information problem. The first uh, program is called SciLine, and it is specifically to put trusted scientific spokespersons in between the, uh, a media reporter that, you know, we're lucky if they're a science reporter, they're probably not. They probably write for the culture page or something and were said, go do a story on red wine. Um, where are they gonna start? AAAS has this program in place now with a really essentially a speaker's bureau where we have um, identified and vetted a number of scientists in a great variety of topics who can speak 
with authority and help filter out the noisiness of the natural course of scientific research so that the message that goes out to the news reporter is more on target and hopefully doesn't include so much of the irreproducible stuff so that the message out to the general public has a little bit more clarity and authority. So that's, that's one program. It's called Sciline. You all can volunteer for it. You can be these trusted intermediaries in the communication process. The other program is called the Epi Center. This program is, uh, it, it's, it, it exists, it's growing. It will open officially this summer. Currently, they're searching, the search is on this month for the director of the Epi Center. Apply if you want to, that's great. The purpose here is, is to do a, a rather similar thing, to put trusted scientific voices as an intermediary between the primary research and, but now in this case, the public policy decision makers, the congresspersons, the people who are making policy and laws on the basis of whatever they can figure out from the scientific literature. You don't want those laws based on the, the, the chaos, including the unreproducibility, but also including the trial and error of natural science, unfiltered. Uh, so so uh, the epicenter puts, again, um, trusted, not trusted, vetted scientific interpreters between the body of scientific literature and the, in this case, the consumer being uh, public policy people. Great, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm the outlier here. <laughs> so I'm Ned Hall, I teach in the philosophy department at Harvard. I uh, focus on philosophy of science. Um, the, the issues we're talking about are interesting to me because of my interest in a really, really big picture question about science, um, which is, how did we get so good at inquiry? It's a relatively, historically speaking, it's a relatively recent phenomenon, you know, maybe arguably 400 years old. And the pace at which we as a species have gotten better at investigating um, the natural world at all different scales has increased rapidly since then. And there's a really interesting question how that came to be. And it's, it's an incredibly complex question. One of the luxuries of being a philosopher is you get to focus on these questions at a very, very big picture level. Um, and I'll sort of make some comments that bear on what we're talking about today from that perspective. I do so very tentatively because one of the deficits of being a philosopher is that you're not a you know, philosopher of sciences, that you're not a practicing science, <clears throat> scientist. Like I had a pretty solid undergraduate education in chemistry because I did that as well as philosophy. But, you know, I do not have the working understanding of what it's like to practice scientific inquiry in the, in the way you do. So the comments I'm gonna make are made in a very tentative spirit. Um, from the kind of big picture perspective, um, I think you know, one, one point that I think is, is worth emphasizing, and it's a kind of obvious point, is that there's a kind of ethical stance that's embedded in well-functioning scientific communities. And Steve Almo pointed to it when he used the word paranoia. Um, we might, I, I might want to sort of add productive paranoia because Steve didn't have in mind the kind of paranoia that you see on certain like, you know, blogs say. Um, uh, but I, I take it Steve had in mind the, the central, almost sort of ethical importance within scientific communities of focusing squarely on the question, how would we know if we were wrong, right? That's really critical to the way a, a scientific enterprise runs. Um, and that kind of ethical stance, the reason I think it's like valuable to, to draw attention to that ethical stance is because when we think about current worries about replicability, um, there's, there's, I think, an important distinction to draw between two different sources of worry. One source, is, and, and presumably this is what you know, people have in mind when they worry about public trust in, in science. One, one source is, are there forces at work that are compromising the role of that ethical stance within scientific communities? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and some of the speakers we heard today were indicating some that there are such forces for the incentive structures, for example. Um, 
So that's like one set of issues. I think it's useful to distinguish concerns about replicability that really have it at, at their root concerns about whether the, you know, the ethical value of productive paranoia is being eroded in some way, to distinguish those concerns from concerns um, that sort of naturally arise given how much harder scientific inquiry is getting than it was, say, even like 50 years ago. So, so if we go back to, to Steve Almo's talk, his discussion about the importance of having a good data manage, you know, uh, a management system sort of indicates how hard it is now in certain areas of scientific inquiry to productively focus on that question, how would we know if we're wrong? Um, the very fact that so many um, areas of science, say experimental psychology being a, a prominent example, have to use statistical methods. And statistical methods are methods that generally confuse people because we appear to not be wired well to think um, about probability. So witness the sort of frequent misunderstandings of significance testing. No, the fact that areas of science have to use um, statistical methods just um, makes it harder um, uh, in terms of training and um, in other respects to um, uh, adhere to the value of productive paranoia. It doesn't mean that the value is not in place. It just means in practice, it's harder to live up to what it requires. Um, there are other sort of like uh, uh, examples that, um, that come to mind as well. So one that I heard of um, uh, for the first time in a panel discussion I was involved in earlier today concerns climate research. So here's a case where you might think reproducibility is really easy. I have a computer simulation of the climate and you want to sort of check to see whether my simulation is running right. So I give you the input data and you run the simulation yourself. And you think because it's a computer simulation, there should be no question about getting perfect reproducibility there. But it turns out there is now um, because of you know, certain um, computational limitations on computers. It can matter what order, of oper you know, what order certain operations are done in a simulation. And when you're simulating chaotic um, systems, um, sort of very, very tiny discrepancies can propagate. So, so even, even there, we have, um, we have what you might call sort of technical obstacles to living up to the ethical standard of being productively paranoid. I think that's just part of, that should have been expected. And it's part of the normal and healthy development of science that the more we learn about the world, the more cutting edge research um, runs up against harder and harder um, problems or, or more and more serious challenges in trying to enforce this ethic of productive paranoia. Um, and that's not something that should occasion any concern, except for the, the reasons Pam was just talking about, that there's this, uh, this interface between science and the public that makes the entire issue about um, a sort of repli replicability so-called crisis much more vexed, which is the, the kinds of obstacles to being productively paranoid that I'm highlighting are just lost on the public. I think the public tends to think, well, look, um, if a study says that this treatment um, has this outcome, then uh, that must be true or else um, there was malfeasance or else there was a kind of you know, mistake of the first kind I indicated before. Scientists are, are, are um, you know, there's, there's something like fraud or incompetence. And that's just a confusion about the way in which science progresses. Um, so those are just some sort of quick, very, very high level thoughts that uh, so I wanted to get out there at the beginning of discussion, but in the interest of time, Thank we'll you. stop. Thanks. Thanks. I'm a, Tony, I'm a postdoc at Tufts in uh, downtown Boston. Um, I work at the neuroscience department. So I'm at the bench doing uh, still a lot of pipetting doing the real science uh, together with my colleagues. And I first came in contact with reproducibility when I did my graduate studies back in Amsterdam, um, actually learning the proper statistical methods, not from my biology colleagues, but from the uh, psychology uh, colleagues uh, that we worked with uh, within the department. And then I came to Boston to do my postdoc, and actually I was hit hard by e-reproducibility uh, pretty quickly within my postdoc. I took over a project, uh, supposed to be an easy project, and um, what it turned out to be, uh, after two years of uh, spending a significant amount of time on that, is that something changed in the uh, transgenic mouse model that we used. Uh, so the data became irreproducible, um, where I lost a lot of my time, but also the postdoc with the previous work uh, I lost a lot of time. Um, and 
a, a chance of publication. Uh, so since then, I've been really driving within my lab and also colleagues in the department um, better ways of uh, doing research, better ways of doing methods, uh, focusing both on statistics, how we can do better uh, statistical analysis, but also really looking at protocols um, and comparing um, within the literature, within the uh, field, what are the common practices versus what are the best practices. and try to move from common practices like this is how we always do it this is like most of the people do it in the field too this is, has been published as best practices and we should be focusing on doing the best practices um, so i'm really um, bottom bottom up driven to change the reproducibility crisis into uh, reproducibility science uh, I'm Alex Tucker. Uh, I'm a program director at, at Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, uh, so I work in industry and um, we work in a, a quite a different ecosystem uh, where the end product of all of our work is largely anonymized from the individual. It's mostly it's mostly representative of the entire company, um, which creates an internal ecosystem um, that that pushes us to to do our best work because we know our work is going to be representative of a, of a much larger of, of a much larger um a much larger company also that work touches many more hands as part of an in, as part of the company so for example any project i work on might go through 20 to 30 people and they may have to reproduce at some point some part of that um also because we work with other companies and we work with consumers uh we feel uh direct meaningful and instantaneous financial um, impact if we, if our products or processes are not re reproducible. Um, so that's, that's my. Great. Um, I like to go back to Tony since you're kind of on the ground in academia doing this work. Um, one of my questions is kind of what are the daily barriers to scientists being able to do robust and reproducible work? I know it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes, time away from your time at lab, honestly, on the bench to be able to ensure you're getting the right method, you're reporting data in the best way possible. So what's like the environment like on the ground? And also, are there ways that other areas like journals and other um, incentive structures can be put in place to encourage scientists to take that time? Yeah, I think it's a good question to start with. Um, what I mostly see is indeed time is an issue. We're all focused on getting that significant result uh, that, that's uh, asterisk above our uh, graph and that the PI says, oh, that looks fantastic. Let's uh, start writing a manuscript. Um, I think it's, it's partly that incentive that we're driven towards having that significant result uh, for our experiments and also not having the proper training uh, I think we can do a better job in, uh, in general in the field of science of proper training on scientific methods, uh, including statistics, uh, not only statistics like after you've done your, done your, done your studies, but really uh, including statistics when you set up your studies. Uh, I think we, as biologists, lack a lot of training uh, there. Um, and it's, again, the incentives also, like these are the common practices uh, how everybody does it in the field. So let's stick to those common practices. And I think that's that incentive is not only coming from the PI, but it's coming from colleagues, uh, from uh, senior faculty, junior faculty, uh, when you give a presentation. Um, so it's difficult to move from uh, common practices to these are actually the best practices. Mm -hmm. Do you have, Alex, have any commentary on that from an industry perspective, how you're able to encourage these common practices in your environment? I think it goes back to sort of the end goal of what we do, which is ultimately um, the end product of our work is going to be manufacturing some product in probably three plants across the world. So the robustness um, really has to be there for, from the start, and we enter with that, with that end goal in mind. Um, and so at any point if something came up that were not super reproducible or super robust, we would probably drop it early on. Not there wouldn't be something interesting in that, in the, in the fact that it's not reproducible or robust, um, but that's built into the process of sort of what our end goal is. Yeah. Um, 
something we discussed during some of our pre-discussions that we've had is that there's a lot of different strategies to address this crisis, um, including those top-down strategies, so sorts of rules and regulations from journals or funding agencies, or those bottom-up strategies, like starting with the scientists, starting with the culture. So we think both of these strategies are important, but do you guys have a sense of what you think might be more feasible to implement or will engender more responses from the scientific community? As an individual researcher, I can say uh, most easy is to start right now as an individual scientist and try to educate yourself. Where can I do better research? Uh, are the methods that I'm doing really the best me methods that I can use? Uh, use PubMed to search uh, the method that are you, you're using, the statistic, no, statistical method, the analysis method that you're using. Uh, are those the best practices in the field? And maybe can I change something in the, in the work that I'm doing? Uh, so I would say as a, as a scientist, uh, you can start today uh, with your own work. Uh -oh. The publishing community, not just Science Magazine, but other scientific journals, are are talking about this thing called the top guidelines, transparency and openness protocols. It, it's a it's a very specific list of features in a way. If, for example, so I have the list here, so I don't forget any <laughs> citation standards, um, analytical methods, like was was the uh, observer, was the result blindly observed or not? Um, Pre-registration of data analysis plans, we heard mention of that earlier. Data transparency, depositing data in publicly available databases. So there's this list of, of features, and then cross-cutting that, there's a list of how close are we to perfection on those features three layers are listed there. One is um, that the journal just says, tell us if you feel like it. That's level one. That's not very much of a lever. Uh, level two is uh, not only do you have to tell us, but you have to have done this. For example, uh, level on, on data transparency, level one might be, did you or did you not deposit your data in Figshare? The answer could be yes or no. Either one would be okay. Level two, did you or did you not deposit your data in Figshare? The answer has to be yes. You have to have done it. And level three, where honestly most of the journals are not here yet because we don't have the time, money, and personnel to do this, is someone else independently has to verify that you did that thing. So with these, with these definitions, you can imagine uh, uh, maybe an, an eight by three grid uh, of check marks. And if you get all the check marks in the right place, you score hundred percent, that's great. Nobody's there yet. But some lesser score than that could identify a paper that has made some progress towards reproducibility and distinguish it from a paper that has really done nothing in that direction. So I have a question about that, actually. I think that's a really great system. I'm wondering how we can make that sort of system desirable. So for scientists to say, I want to make sure that my paper has is meeting all these top guidelines, because I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that's a priority of researchers. So Indeed, do, do you there. or others have thoughts of how we can make that a priority? Anyone else want to do that? <laughs> one, one, Maybe, although I don't think you're all going to like this, we could say you can't publish your paper in science <laughs> unless you get score like, I don't know, I'll pick a number, 80% or up, for example. I think that would be very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. We're not, we're not there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> or, you know, funding agencies, grants saying you yeah. need to have this, this overall percentage for your more recent papers and yeah. top guidelines. And let me just say why and how we're not there yet, even though this idea exists and it seems like it's a good idea. The, the publishing, and, and as, I, as I mentioned, it's, it's important to me that you understand, again, that science is published by a society of members of you, 
a, mem a scientific membership society publishes science. It's a conversation between communities. It's not your grade school teacher saying you have to do this and you just, you have to do it. Uh, we can't, as publishers, we can't put in place guidelines that you, the community, are not prepared to buy into. We can encourage that conversation, you know, and sort of push gently in directions that we think are important while you're pushing in directions that you think are important. And hopefully we end up at a consensus position where we are reflecting the community appropriately and not dragging you by the hair into some direction you don't want to go. It, um, just just to go back to your original question and pick up on something Tony said about education, because it, it sounds like to address the, the problem there, there are questions about how to, how to change the social structures within science. There are also questions about education. And this is not a very sexy uh, recommendation, but you know, improved education and statistics at the undergraduate level could help, right? Coming at this from philosophy of science, where there's a lot of discussion of the relative merits of frequentist and Bayesian approaches to statistics, it's kind of a consensus view that Bayesianism is the more intellectually credible one. But at any rate, a, a modest dose of Bayesian statistics in any stats course would help people avoid the mistake of thinking, oh, if my carefully designed study allows me to reject the null hypothesis at the 0.05 level, that means that there's only a one in 20 chance that the null hypothesis is true. You know, like that, if you could erase that mistake, you know, like cross all um, scientific communities, that would be a vast improvement right there. I'd like to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Yeah, this is kind of a philosophical question, I guess, but, um, you know, I would hear you say a lot, like, how do I determine whether or not we're wrong? And is part of the problem, I'm coming from an academic lab, like, we're, we don't always look at the possibility that we might be wrong, that, our, you know, our favorite hypothesis is right. maybe wrong, that, you know, our pet project is wrong, that, you know, we, we sort of approach it, you know, thinking it's going to be right, and if it doesn't turn out to be right, well, we must have screwed up somewhere or right. you know, didn't use the right method. So I was wondering if you thought how much that kind of played yeah. into it. I'm just going to pa paraphrase that for the live stream. I think what you're asking is, I think a lot of times as scientists, we say, my experiment didn't work. And we're not necessarily saying our hypothesis was wrong. We're saying, you know, something when I was doing this didn't work, so that's why it didn't work. It's not because my hypothesis was wrong. So do you guys have commentary on that? Because that kind of, I think, drives a lot of irreproducibility because you're not necessarily doing something unethical, but you aren't doing something that's completely robust. And I think that's a very right. common practice in science uh, every day. I think we're making improvements there already by having uh, repositories like AdGene, which you know the reagents are verified, so you know the reagents are good. Um, protocols that are online, that you can find online, um, better reporting in uh, journals, like the STAR method in, the, in the cell and neuron, for instance, where you really have a lot of detail of the, on the methods. So I think we can already be more sure when we have a negative result, that it's a real negative result and not just us saying, uh, like an imposter syndrome, it must be us who are doing the uh, wrong experiment or the wrong methods. So I think we're improving there. Still a long way to go, but doing better. Any other thoughts? Just one quick thing. I, I think it's psychologically unrealistic to expect every practicing scientist to be squarely focused on the question like, how do I know if I'm, you know, how would I know if I'm wrong? So in a way, what you want is a social structure where you can count on other members of the community to check you as necessary, right? And and then for that purpose, it's the kinds of things Tony's been emphasizing are absolutely crucial. You have to be able to present your results to the community at large in a way where they can follow your chain of reasoning. Right. Um, so something we've been talking about today that's been very interesting is uh, streamlining and having a uh, pipeline. Um, but interestingly enough, now that we're talking about reproducibility, we have all of these different tools that don't seem to really be communicating with each other. So I was wondering if you guys, or if you all, um, 
foresee any issues with regards to reproducibility um, now that we have so many different like, companies and, and uh, tools coming up that are uh, streamlined together? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So just to repeat it for the live stream, even you can see in our pamphlet, we have a lot of different companies that are coming up now that have reproducibility-driven missions, but oftentimes there's not a lot of uh, interaction between these different companies or organizations. So how can we kind of resolve that problem to make sure we're all working together towards reproducible results? I find it a difficult one, a difficult question as well. Um, there's a lot of, for instance, there's a lot of uh, electronic notebook uh, software packages out there. And there's so many, you don't know which one is going to be the best one, which one uh, is going to be the recognized one. I think there's also an issue with uh, once I put my data in there um, and the company goes bust, will I be able to retrieve my data? Uh, for, so in my example, in our lab, and I see it around in other labs as well, we may try it a little bit. Um, but then we say, no, it's actually not so convenient to work with, and we don't know what the, what's going to happen with the data. Uh, the PI may not be necessarily supporting it. Um, so what I can only say is that I acknowledge the issue, and um, I think it may be a slow progress, but more and more people start using the software software packages, and maybe one or two uh, packages may sort of surface and become the best and well-used uh, packages. But for now, it's uh, yeah, it's still a big issue. Do you guys have any more thoughts on that? I would say maybe it would be the responsibility of larger professional organizations like AAAS or the NIH funding agencies to kind of create some sort of umbrella program. We have run into these issues with even science communication and outreach groups. There's so many groups, even just within Boston, that don't communicate and talk to each other about these issues. So. Um, yeah, it's a really hard question to answer, but thank you for that. Yeah. So I have a question for Alex. Um, so do you find, I think one of the, for me, one of the best selling points for using sort of best practices is that industry science demands it. Um, and many people are moving to industry science from academia. And in fact, in my many years doing this, people used to think that industry science was poor science and Whereas in academia, you could get an N of three published and sell, and no project like that would ever go forward in a company. You know, so actually, the more rigorous science is going on in, in industry, far more rigorous. So, how do we? Maybe one of the selling points, like, do you look for scientists who speak rigor when they come to interview with you? Um, is that a key, is that a key point in your searching for for scientists? Um, yes, we look for scientists who can communicate, um, period. Like, one big challenge is like, try communicating a method that's like, not in a scientific paper. Like, we do, we, we, we send packets of, of, of SOPs and that's still not enough information to communicate from one side to another, just because there's so much information. I think just going through the process of, of ex trying to explain how you did something, um, you run up on all these issues and you understand why there are, are, are problems with reproducibility just because there's so much infra institutional knowledge, also just because there's differences from side to side. And I think that um, that's something that we really in, in, in embrace is um, communicate it, have other people try it and make sure that you're, make sure you're doing this as much as possible to, to get that information across. Um, because information loss, I think is one of the biggest challenges we face. I think that's a really interesting point, thinking about it in terms of being an incentive for someone to hire you, is I do robust and reproducible research. Here's why. Look at my top guidelines on my paper. So I think that's a really interesting trend to follow for the future. Um, any other questions from the audience? We have time for at least one more. Yeah. I don't know if any of you know the answer to this question, but is the rate of retraction higher in papers coming from academia versus industry? So the question is whether the rate of retraction of papers is higher in academic papers versus papers from industry. Uh, let me uh, throw a monkey wrench in that question. We don't get that many papers from industry, I think. I And correct me if I'm wrong, but publishing in the in the public world is not 
completely part of the incentive structure in industry. And there's a much, there's a greater incentive to keep information in a proprietary status. So we, we get a few papers from industry. I'm not saying it's zero by any means, but I don't think we can make a statistically valid comparison because the two universes are functioning differently. What? <laughs> um, actually, a follow-up question based on that. Something that I do know is true is that the retraction rate is indeed higher in some of these higher impact journals than mm -hmm. the lower impact journals. So I'm wondering, um, and something else that was brought up earlier as well is the fact that when you get reviews back, oftentimes they'll say, if you show this, then we will publish you. And so there's a lot of pressure on researchers to show that outcome. So I'm wondering in terms of, Pam, in terms of journals, how do you sort of try to protect against these pressures on scientists to produce certain outcomes, which could lead to biases or them reporting some results versus other results? What can you do? That's what the whole peer review system is there to help to try to ferret out yeah. things that are results that are not standing up strongly enough. Um, let me also throw out there that as the, as the scientist standing behind a paper, you're not required to publish it in, in any particular journal. You're not required by me. If, <clears throat> if a referee comes back and says, I'm really interested in this new piece of experimental information, and you say, no, that doesn't fit with what I want to achieve philosophically, then go to a different journal. You know? There are thousands of journals to choose from. Well, unfortunately, it's not a yeah. philosophical issue or philosophical <laughs> question. Uh, your job is on the line, uh, and you need to have that science yeah. nature paper yeah. on your resume. Um, and you don't have, agreed, you don't have time to go to the next uh, journal and start a process all over. You need to be applying for those faculty positions uh, right away uh, with that uh, uh, science nature journal on your resume. So it's not as easy as just say, I can go somewhere else. I can do uh, plus one or. Right. But, but your group description also it sounds like you're putting the process in the reviewer's hand to drive the science. And you know, as a PI, I have a complete story, which may well be complete, but there's always more that you can do. And your comment sounded like you're giving the reviewer free reign to ask for that more. Uh, sorry, no, I didn't mean to leave that impression. It, it's, it's a messy decision space. Uh, reviewers, who are, by the way, you, you know, every one of you who's an author is also in the reviewer camp. Uh, there is a, a, a sort of a natural tendency to be enthusiastic and say, this is really cool. Wouldn't it be great to go here, here, and here with this research project? Uh, um, and I, I will, if I feel like the referees have gone too far, I'll go back to the referees and say, I don't necessarily say ring it in, but <laughs> I will challenge them. I'll say, is that really necessary for this paper? Or are you really talking about enthusiasm for work in the future? So I do engage with that conversation. It's, it's, they don't get free reign. You don't get free reign. Um, because every, we all realize that there's, um, this is difficult work to do, scientific research. It's difficult to do. And you can't just willy nilly ask for more stuff if maybe the reagents are extraordinarily expensive, maybe, if you're working on, on post-mortem human brains and you were lucky to get three samples, you know, they can't, they can't, they can't say bring the statistics up to 50. That's not going to work. Um, so it, it, trying to decide where to stop with a paper is uh, an, an intellectual engagement from all parties involved, the authors who can say, stop, I stop here, I'm not going to go any further. The referees who can say they've really done their best, they can't get anymore. 
and, and the editor who is in there saying, you know, have you asked her too much? Really? Is that, do we need to bring it down a bit? Yeah. And hopefully, like Jeff Flyer said from uh, Bill Kalin's paper, we'll be publishing more houses of brick rather than mansions of straw. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll take this one. Yeah, just as a follow-up to this idea that there are so many different stakeholders at play in this peer review process, sometimes unreasonable requests can get made, et cetera. To what extent do you think that the current privacy of the peer review process enables this kind of behavior? And what are your opinions on publishing the content, not necessarily identities of peer reviewers? Publishing the contents of the peer review, but we should also talk about publishing the identities of the peer reviewers. That was mentioned earlier. Yes. The contents. I don't know. I don't know. I I I I I know there's a tremendous move to openness and all that kind of stuff, but aren't you guys busy? Are you, are you really going to go back and read? the three earlier iterations that were not as good as the one that got published well, I, and all the comments, the back and forth, the nitty gritty. Really? You really want to read that? I mean, you could also say, why should anyone read the actual paper? You can just read the abstract. I mean, I think there's a long tail of, okay. of people <laughs> who, are, who may, it's a small number, but uh, for papers that if we really want to provide evidence that this process is working, um, perhaps some people would be interested. Mm -hmm. But I would think it would make a difference to the reviewer's psychology knowing that they're, yes. even yeah. if their identities yeah, are hidden. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I, I think that it, at, in, in my chair at Science Magazine, I think I probably have a rather privileged view on the universe of referee comments. When every once in a while, when I see referee comments from another journal, I, I realize that referees are in a way, um, organizing their own behavior according to the venue that they're talking to. For the, for the absolute most part, the referee comments that I'm looking at in the context of Science Magazine are thoughtful and on target. Now, some people don't, and that's, that happens. But I think that for lesser journals, I think referees try less hard actually. Could just one quick comment just to endorse this idea. Having referee comments publicly available is another way for young practitioners to learn better what the what the standards are within the field too. Mm -hmm. Certainly in in my own field. Yeah, the things, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take one more question. I just wanted to add one comment to that. I think it's a kind of interesting to what you said earlier about the difference between common practice and best practice. And opening up peer review might actually be a driver yeah. towards best practice as opposed to common practice. Yeah, the comment was about the differences between common and best practices and the differences between them and how that uh, affects the scientific enterprise. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists who are in the hot seat here, uh, getting some tough questions from our audience. And uh, we'll now break for a little bit of food and fun at the back. And thank you to the live stream for tuning in.